So what we'd like to do next is introduce two models, two ways of formalizing the relationships between a um, number of macroeconomic aggregates uh, or variables. Uh, these, uh, these models are intended to capture some, some major lines of historical debate within macroeconomics. So, so we call them the classical model and the Keynesian model, understanding that the positions that have actually been held on the various sides of these debates are, are much more complex and diverse than we can we can capture in, in two simple models. But nonetheless, we think, I think, uh, the distinctions between these models do do really point up some 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 sort of critical cleavages in the way people uh, historically have thought about the economy and 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 continue to think about it today. And in this presentation, I should say, I'm following fairly closely the discussion in uh, chapter two of Snowden and Vane, uh, Modern Macroeconomics, its origins, history, and current state. So our two models, as I say, we're, we're calling the first one the classical model and the second one the Keynesian model. Uh, these are two ways of thinking about the relationships between some of our core macroeconomic variables. Uh, we're starting with, but they, they, they're obviously um, have certain, certain important things in common. So first of all, both of these are, are describing a model and describing an economy with no government um, and no external sector. There's no, there's no fiscal policy. Um, there's no explicit monetary policy. There's no um, you know, foreign trade in these models. That's, we've, we've abstracted away from, from those dimensions of the economy. So that means that when we talk about output, represented as usual by Y, that um, consists purely of, of consumption and investment. And we don't need to worry about the exact national accounting uh, definitions of those terms as far as the model is concerned. Of course, as always, when you start using a model as a tool to describe concrete events in the world, then you do need to start worrying about uh, these definitions. But as far as the logic of the model goes, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter. The important thing from our point of view is, is the distinction in a general way between consumption as, as spending carried out by households in order to meet their own immediate needs and investment as an activity carried out by businesses um, in order to increase future production. This is something, something that the sort of classical vision as it's, as it's sort of embodied here and the Keynesian vision have in common is they do think of the economy as being, uh, as, as including both households and businesses, the, the sort of more modern versions of the classical story just have a single kind of representative agent. They don't, they don't but in terms of the formalities of the model, it doesn't necessarily make a big difference, but, but in terms of the stories we're telling, in both cases, we have households consuming, businesses investing. Um, then we have savings. Now, savings in a macroeconomics context, uh, represented by letter S, and incidentally, I should say as a, as a convention that we're often going to find, a capital letter is typically um, an economy-wide aggregate, total output, total consumption, total investment, total savings. The, if we use a lowercase equivalent, for instance, lowercase s, we're typically talking about a, a, a rate or ratio um, for instance, it would be, it's very common to see total savings represented as capital S and, and the fraction of income that is saved, the, the aggregate savings rate as lowercase s. Well, here we've got total savings S and that's defined in, in almost any macroeconomic context as simply whatever part of income is not used for consumption. Uh, that the income received by households is understood to be divided between the portion they consume and the portion they save. Then we've got labor. So we think of a, a sort of homogeneous quantity labor, which is being supplied by households uh, in return for a, a price, the wage. These, these models, as, as we're writing them here, we're, we're, we should think of the wage as being a real wage. Um, it doesn't, you know, uh, so let's, let's say it's the real wage. It's a basket of consumption goods, which is, is, is the, you know, the, the unit, the price for one unit of, of this uh, quantity of labor. And then we've got a, a money stock. In, in, in modern contexts, 
we probably wouldn't talk about the money stock, but Keynes himself certainly talks quite a lot about the money stock. And so in our Keynesian model, we have a stock of money as we do in our classical model. And we have a price level, the, the price per unit of output. So those are sort of the building blocks for both of our models. Now then our, our classical model here, well, let's pause for a moment. What do we mean by classical? Keynes uses the term in a somewhat eccentric way to basically mean all the, all the economists up to him. So everybody from Adam Smith through Pigau, who's his kind of big adversary to some extent in the, in the or representative of the, of the position he's arguing against in, in the general theory, they're all bunched together as, as classical economists. That's not generally the way the term is used. More often, certainly in, 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 a, in a heterodox setting um, but, or a history of thought setting, when we talk about classical economists, we're talking about the tradition that runs from Smith, Ricardo, Malthus, Marx, and and you know lesser figures of that era, as against the the marginalists, you know, uh, who come after them: Valras, Jevons, um, uh, Edgeworth, and and you know, to some extent Alfred Marshall, although maybe he he falls a little bit in between. Um, so, in other words, the, the first group, the classical economists, are interested very much in the, in, the, in the behavior of the economy as a whole, although in a different way than, than what we think of as macroeconomists. They're interested in the division of income between different social classes. They're interested in the long run historical trajectory of, of the capitalist economy. Um, they're, very, they're very interested in sort of the, the, the broad social groupings of labor, land, capital. Uh, and they don't, um, and, and they tend to think of, 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 of prices as determined by costs. They, they, all of them embrace some form of the labor theory of value, um, as opposed to the marginalists who are not interested in classes or long-term trajectories. They're interested in a more sort of abstract logic based on uh, optimization at an individual level and uh, see value as being derived from uh, some sort of interaction of, of production conditions, you know, as reflected in labor values and, and you demand as reflecting utility, sort of this new new concept that, that comes in with the marginals. Well, this is not a history of thought class, so, so we'll stop there, but I'm just, the point is just, who are we talking about when we say classical? Well, in this context, we don't actually mean the people who are usually called classical economists in other contexts. We mean the position that Keynes is arguing against. So Keynes's phrase that he uses in, in a later article, a composite ant sally of uncertainty. Is this an actual position that is held by somebody or is it a sort of composite position that's standing in for a number of, of, of people he disagrees with? It's, it's, it's probably the latter, but that's okay because the model does, I think, capture some, some commonalities among a lot of, you know, pre immediately pre-Keynesian economists, but also sort of anti-Keynesian positions that have been taken since then. So, sort of in terms of the sort of thinking underlying this, this model, that the, the critical thing is that is that price adjustment is seen as sort of the central um, factor determining outcomes in the economy. You, you, you have a basic vision where you, where you have some, some kind of underlying schedule, supply, demand, production conditions, whatever, and, and, and that creates a set of outcomes and, and which one you get at depends on the adjustment of some sort of price. So prices are adjusting and then people's behavior is, is adjusting to the price. That's sort of the underlying mechanism. These prices are flexible. They allow, they, they, they quickly move to where they need to be and markets clear. People's behavior in turn responds appropriately to the price. So the consistency of the plans or intentions of different units in the economy is maintained by adjustments of prices. Sort of the underlying vision of this thing. Now, a um, little typo there, I said it's more recent, strongly intertemporal, that should be strongly, all right. Um, in other words, the, the sort of contemporary orthodoxy that in some ways picks up on the classical story really is very interested in, in um, behavior over time, choices being made over time. That's not really the case of the classical model that we're gonna talk about here. And then finally, um, and this is really a, a very fundamental cleavage, the vision here is, is, is um, what we call real exchange. In other words, the fundamental processes of the economy are a bunch of things, commodities existing out there in the world that are being traded in some fashion. So it's, 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 it's real that we start with the actual stuff. Money is a secondary or incidental factor and, and, and we think of a process of exchange. Whereas the Keynesian vision is, is, is one of a monetary production economy. Money is central. It, it's, it's the organizing structure of the economy that we really can't abstract away from, and the economy does not consist, the, the basic vision of the economy is not one of, of, of exchange of existing stuff, but an organized 
process of production. So underlying visions. All right, so our classical model then, um, we start with a production function, then we add a labor market, then we add a loanable funds market, and then we, we, we bring in the quantity theory of money. And essentially, as I'll, I'll walk through in a moment, the first two of these ingredients determine how much will be produced. The third one tells us how that production will be um, divided between consumption and investment. And then the quantity theory basically says money is off on the side, money and prices are off on the side, not interacting with the real um, pieces at all. So we'll start with this production function. Um, what does this say? It says output, Y, is a function, F is just a function of capital, that's that capital K, and labor, and then A, which is some parameter representing technology. So essentially you've got a box and the more capital and the more labor you throw in one end, the more stuff output comes out the other end. And that process may be more or less, um, it may, you, can, you can scale it up or down based on the progress of, of the production technology you're using. But the basic vision here is that we think of production as being a, a physical process where you're putting inputs in at one end and getting output in at the other. And that's the fundamental production activity of the economy. Is it's, it's, it's taking place, um, as we imagine, a sort of physical production process where you're, you're turning these inputs, capital and labor, into an output. Um, the more capital and labor you put in, the more output you get out at the other end. Now, this framework is still the dominant framework in, in a lot of macroeconomic context. Um, it's, it's one that has also been um, criticized um, in part because of rather profound measurement issues that the, the, the technology term is really just a kind of catch all to make, you know, there's no independent way of measuring it. In capital stock, although we think there ought to be a way of measuring it in practice, it's very hard to define what a, what a quantity of capital is in a meaningful way. This was a huge source of controversy between um, uh, in, the, in the mid 60s between sort of British Keynesian economists and, and American uh, economists and continues to be something we, what, what does it mean to talk about a quantity of capital? Very, very deep and difficult question. We don't need to engage with that question here because this is a model of a short period in which we can assume that capital and technology are fixed. So what we really have here is a, is a output as a function of the labor input. That's what we, that's what we're actually using here. And this just says output as, as a function of labor, it, it, it increases, the first derivative is positive. The more labor you put in, the more output you get out, but the second derivative is negative. Each additional unit of labor gets you less output than the previous one. Uh, so this is this is the piece that you actually need to make this thing run. Uh, so that's our first piece, our, our production function. And we can graph this. This graph is taken from the Snowden and Vane book like this, um, uh, where we say at any given moment we've got we've got um, a production function that, that's going to define for each quantity of labor we put in a level of output that we get out. Um, if we had a better technology that level of output would be higher. Uh, so, um, but then you can see this thing, this thing curves downward. It's, 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 um, so, so that shows us that we get decreasing returns. Each, each unit of labor is, is producing less than the previous one. All right, so that's our production function. Next, we add to that a labor market. The labor market essentially says we've got an exchange between businesses, employers, and, and work households as workers. Um, now, on the one hand, businesses will, 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 will uh, be willing to pay for labor as long as the amount that the, that unit of labor produces is more than the cost of it. So in a competitive market, which we're assuming here, eventually the price of, of that labor gets bid up to its marginal product. Meaning um, if, if, if one additional worker, one additional hour of labor will produce, you know, $20 worth of output, it's worth it from your point of view as an employer to hire that additional hour as long as you can get it for $20 or less. And as employers compete for labor, they eventually bid the price of labor up so that the exact last unit of labor is getting exactly the amount that it produced. That's the point where it's not worthwhile for employers to hire any additional labor. So the result of that is the wage equals the marginal product of labor. On the other side, uh, 
workers are supplying labor, but they find that unpleasant, perhaps not the least realistic assumption in this model. Uh, and maybe, maybe a little bit more or less plausible. Uh, the, the disutility of labor is rising. The more work hours of labor household supply, the more onerous they find it to supply one more hour. So as the uh, marginal product of labor is falling and the marginal disutility of labor is rising, eventually you arrive at a wage, which is um, at such a level that it would not be worth it from the employer's point of view to hire even one more hour of labor. And it would not be worth it from the worker's point of view to do even one more hour of labor at that wage. And that is where the level that that then determines the level of employment and the level of the wage. Um, again, we've got a notion that we have flexible prices and, 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 and rapidly clearing markets. So wages and employment will adjust rapidly to bring employment to this level where the wage is equal to both the marginal product of labor and the marginal disutility of labor. Now, the level of output, the level of employment that is determined in the labor market, then we, we can stick that into our production function and figure out the level of output. So we start with our labor market, which tells us if we, if we well, that we need, the, we need the two of them together because we don't know the marginal product without the production function. So the marginal product and the production function jointly determine a unique level of output. Um, so we can say that the, the um, the out, in this model, the output is determined in, in the labor market. So this again is just making the point as we, as we, as we imagine this thing um, uh, getting flatter down here, we see this, the slope of the line, which is, is getting um, lower. The line is getting flatter, the slope is getting lower and that defines a wage, a real wage. That's why it says W over P associated with each level of employment. All right. so. Our labor market and production function together determine a unique level of employment and a unique level of output. Then we have the loanable funds market, which determines how that output is divided between investment and consumption. And this is mediated by the interest rate. The interest rate here is, is imagined loanable funds is, is a term you certainly still encounter. And it implies the, the, the amount of income that households are choosing not to consume and which therefore is available potentially for investment. Whether these funds take the form of, of money or, or not is, is not really relevant here. In fact, the assumption would be that it, it, makes, it does not make sense to think of them in terms of money, but in terms of an actual stock of goods that households had access to, but chose not to consume and therefore could loan to businesses in order to use for purposes of investment. The price of, of, of this is the interest rate. Investment is a declining function of the interest rate. The higher the interest rate, the less businesses want to invest. Savings is an increasing function of the interest rate. The higher the interest households get on their savings, the more they will wish to save. The interest rate then exactly as in all these markets, you know, all these markets, they all work exactly the same way. Uh, so the interest rate adjusts to the level that leaves the, 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 the savings desired savings at that interest rate to be exactly equal to the desired investment at that interest rate. So we can conceptually think of households selling their unused income for investment at that price. Um, again, we assume that, that you know, we get to that price quickly and investment and savings respond to it. So this is, this is you know, you could say it's a version of, or it's, 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 a, it's an implication of, or it's, it's, a, it's associated with the notion of Say's law, which essentially says, there is no possibility of a demand shortfall because any production that's not consumed is by definition invested. There's always any, any, any act of production by its nature creates uh, demand for that production. There's no possibility of an of a excess demand across the board. So the, the weak form of this is, is true by definition. It is true as an accounting convention that everything that is produced in the economy is consumed by somebody. We have this category in the national accounts called inventory investment, which is, is simply unsold goods, unsold finished goods and goods in, prog in process that end the period in the hands of the producer. We, we simply say as, as a matter of accounting that the, the producer purchased that stuff as a form of investment. So we have inventory investment to ensure that everything that is produced is also purchased by somebody. It's just, it's an accounting convention. It's not a, so that that much is, is true. On the other hand, the, the strong form is, is, is going a step beyond that and essentially saying anything that, that can be produced is going to, there's going to be demand for it. You can't, you can't have a shortfall of demand. And, and of course that's not true by definition and uh, the argument of, of Keynes 
and, and many subsequent economists and some earlier economists is that in that strong form, it, it doesn't hold at all, that it's perfectly possible to have production that does not take place because of a lack of demand. But in the Say's Law story, once you've defined the sort of physical production capabilities of the economy as defined by that production function and that labor market, it, that is how much will always be produced. And the only question is how it will be divided between consumption and investment. So again, all these graphs look exactly the same. You got one line sloping up and one line sloping down. In this case, R, the interest rate is, is the price and S and I are, are quantities, um, savings and investment. Um, and at some point in the middle here, there is an interest rate such that the desired savings of households and the desired investment of businesses at that interest rate will be exactly equal. And that's, that's where we end up. Finally, we add the quantity theory, which is, is the monetary piece of this. So the quantity theory starts with the notion that there is a quantity of money, a fixed, we can identify a fixed exogenous quantity of money. There's so much money in circulation, whether that's defined by the stock of gold available or the foreign exchange reserves available, or it's set you know, by, by the, the central bank or by some other monetary authority, a fiat currency, whatever it is, there is a certain fixed quantity of money in the economy. This money is used in transactions. It's not held as an asset. It's simply used, it's, it's only used to buy and sell things. That is the only function of money in the economy is simply to, to, to carry out purchases that would be you know, less convenient if you had to carry them out through barter. And that there's a stable velocity of money, meaning that the time that it takes money to circulate is, is a somehow fixed technological parameter. Again, it's easy. All this stuff makes sense if your mental image is an economy where money means gold coins. There are only so many gold coins that exist. The time between somebody receiving a good gold coin and then spending it again, you can imagine is sort of being fixed by the sort of the actual concrete conditions that exchange happens under. You know, how often do people go to the market? There you go. So you've got a stable velocity of money. Um, money in this story is completely separate from finance. We've got the interest rate in this loanable funds market where we're moving un unused income over to the business sector where it can be used for investment. That has nothing to do with money. Money is, is, is these tokens used for transactions. It has nothing to do with, with lending and borrowing. So we, ex we summarize these assumptions in, in what we call the equation of exchange. M times V, so the stock of money times the velocity of that money equals P, the average price level, times Y, the quantity of output. Um, this, this form is, is really associated with Irving Fisher, but, but other people wrote down similar equivalent things. Um, so if V is a technological constant, which is, is what we're assuming here, and if Y has already been determined from the real side of the economy, from the, the, the production function and the labor market, then Oh, shoot, that's a typo there. That, that is supposed to be um, M. P and M must move in sync. I'll, I'll, I'll correct that on the slides before I distribute them. But that, that second Y there, that, that, that Y there with the blue box around it should be an M. So if, if V is a technological constant and Y is determined from the real side, then P and M have to move together. So that implies that the, um, the only thing that changes in the money supply can do is generate inflation or deflation. They can generate a higher price level and a lower price level, and that is it. The only thing that adding more money to the economy will do is raise prices across the board. And then that applies in general to any other sort of actor in the economy that we might think of as, as, as doing something to change the money supply. So the term that's used for this is money is neutral. Um, money is, 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 has no effect on the real variables of the economy, production, employment, and so on. And this again is a very long-standing, deeply held orthodox view in economics. The idea that money is neutral, at least in the long run. A lot of people, although not everybody, would agree that in the short run, if prices are slow to adjust, there might in the short run be some relationship between M and Y, but that over time, any change in M is going to be be fully absorbed in an offsetting change in P with no effect on Y or any, any other real outcome at all. This is, this is a very, very long, long-standing view in economics. So we go back to David Hume um, uh, writing in, in 1752, a lot of really, 
I don't know why Adam Smith and not David Hume is credited as being the first economist. A lot of a lot of our uh, ideas in economics go back to Hume. Um, but anyway, Hume says um, money is nothing but the representation of labor and commodities and serves only as a method of rating or estimating them. Where coin is in greater plenty as a greater quantity of it is required to represent the same quantity of goods, it can have no effect either good or bad. This is a very long standing thing. You can find people all through the, the 19th and early 20th century saying the same thing. You know, trying to change economic outcomes by changing the amount of money is like trying to, you know, uh, you know, get more hours in the day by changing the definition of an hour. It's trying to lose weight by, you know, fiddling with your scale. It's trying to get taller by changing the definition of an inch. It's just gonna change the labels on things and have no, no effect on the real outcomes at all. Very, very, very um, frequently repeated idea in, in, in the history of, of sort of mainstream economics. Now we get up to Irving Fisher, who, as I said, is the person who's, um, associated with that, that equation of exchange. He says, the price level varies directly as the quantity of money in circulation. If we increase the number of dollars, prices will increase in the same proportion. The exact same exact same idea of, of, of Hume 170 years earlier. Again, lots of, lots of people in between who, who made the, said the same thing. And then, you know, coming up, uh, you know, to the relatively recent past, Lawrence Meyer, who um, was a member of the uh, Federal Open Market Committee, the, the governing board of the Fed, and Ray wrote a nice little book about his experiences there and actually is a, is a good sort of popularizer of like how the Fed works. But when he sits down to, to explain, well, what, what is the sort of underlying economics of what the Fed is doing? One of the first things he feels obliged to tell people is monetary policy cannot influence real variables such as output and employment. This is often referred to as the principle of the neutrality of money. Second, money growth is the principal determinant of inflation. In the long run, this immediately makes price stability in some shape or form the direct, unequivocal, singular long-term objective of monetary policy. So again, if you believe in this, this is called the classical dichotomy. I should have, I should have put that term on the slides, but the classical dichotomy, the notion that there is a, 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 a strict separation between money and prices on the one hand and the real outcomes of employment, production, income generation, consumption on the other side. Um, if you believe in this, in this classical dichotomy, if you believe in the neutrality of money, one, and if you believe that what the central bank is doing is, is ultimately or fundamentally setting the quantity of money, and, and Lawrence Meyer on the FOMC certainly knew much better than that, but talking to the public, that's, that's how he liked to present things. Um, if you think that what the central bank is simply setting the quantity of money, it follows central bank cannot do anything about real outcomes. All they can do is ensure that the money supply grows at a stable rate so that you get a stable level of inflation. Now, a puzzle you might find yourself wondering about here is if money is neutral, if money has no effect on the real economy and only affects inflation, th then why do we care so much about inflation? Why, why is it so important to keep inflation under control if there's no relationship at all between the behavior of the price level and real outcomes? It's a little, little bit of a mystery there, but, uh, but this is a view that, that many people have, have taken uh, over the years. All right, so that's, that's, that's sort of the, the final piece of it. So we put this together, what have we got? We've got the output is determined by the production function in the labor market. Output is determined in the short because the production function is understood to be stable, changing only very slowly. Um, in the short run, output is determined in the labor market. If you see, um, you know, something, uh, you know, a, a short run change in output, well, you can, you know for sure that probably there's been some change in people's willingness to work or maybe some change in, in people's marginal productivity. Either way, it's in the labor market. Something happened. If, if employment went down, either workers became less productive or they became less willing to work. Those are the only possible explanations. So output is really, I, I write by production function plus labor market, but really I should say output is determined in the labor market. Um, the interest rate mediates the division of output between consumption and investment and money influences only the price level. That's that classical dichotomy. So we've got three sort of protections of um, the stability of the system here. First of all, you've got flexible wages that ensure that you're never going to have involuntary unemployment. Um, if if people, if there's more labor than is employed at the current wage, then, can, then businesses want at the current wage, the wage will fall until that labor is absorbed. And if that wage is, is low enough that people no longer want to work for it, that's not really unemployment. It's just people choosing to, you know, do something else with their time. Uh, you've got flexible interest rates that ensure that you've always got this balance between uh, savings and investment. 
Um, and you've got flexible prices that ensure that any disturbance to the money supply is not going to have any effect on, uh, on, on the rest of the economy. So to kind of sum this up, um, uh, well, to sum it up, here's, here's a diagram. So over here, we've got real sector productivity, you know, as defined by the production function, productivity plus the labor force give us potential output. If output goes up and, and potential output determines actual output, there's no independent influence on output. It's simply determined by the productive capability of the economy. If output goes up, either people became more productive or some sort of technological improvement, or they became more willing to work, or we, we somehow found more people who could work. And conversely, if output goes down, either people became less productive or there's some obstacle to people working. And certainly there are people on the right who, uh, who very strongly are committed to that sort of explanation of variation in output today. This is actually, it's, it's called real business cycle theory. And um, there's plenty of people, you know, uh, at the University of Chicago and elsewhere who, who will tell you that's, that's how things actually work in the real world. Um, so that's, that's, that's this story. We've got the, the labor market basically over here determining how much the economy can produce, which is how much it does produce. Then that output is then divided between consumption and investment through this process. Um, basically, the households are choosing between consumption and saving, and the choice to save is depend, dependent on the interest rate. The interest rate also, of course, is, is interacting with investment. In these sorts of models, the flowchart honestly works nicely for, for the Keynesian story. These sorts of models, the, the supply and demand diagrams are a little, a little more natural because in this story, because we've got supply, savings and investment being uh, balanced with each other via the interest rate, we have to do all these little double lines. Increase in savings is going to lower the interest rate. Higher interest rate is going to uh, induce more savings. On the other hand, what this does bring out very clearly is these, these, all these nice little negative feedback loops that, that, that ensure a, a stable system. So, um, and again, you can see there's a one-way one trip this way. Consumption and savings decisions or investment decisions cannot influence the overall level of, demand, of, of, of output. And then um, over here, completely separate from everything else, we've got the money supply influencing the price level. And again, the quantity theory sort of starts from the assumption that money is exogenous, money is independent, so the arrow goes this way. Um, so that's that's sort of the classical model. Now, again, if you say, well, who is it who's held exactly this view? Maybe you'd have trouble. But if you say, does this sort of bring out common elements in a lot of people's understanding of the economy? The answer is yes, as I, as I just pointed out. The view that money influences only prices and nothing up here is a very widely, overtly, explicitly, strongly held view in big parts of the economics profession. The notion that only the supply side influences output is not widely held for the short term. As I said, there are, there is the real business cycle school. They are not a, a small group in academic economics, but they're not the majority in academic economics and they are not there are a very small minority, I would say, in people writing about policy, although not, not, a, not a non-existent minority. After the Great Recession of a decade ago, there were arguments being seriously made that, you know, the reason unemployment has gone so high is because of the quality of video games that has made people value leisure rather than work so much more. So that's effectively a decline in labor force. People made that argument with a straight face. So there are certainly, the argument that this stuff is, is the factor, is, is determinant even in the short run does exist, but it's the, the, the more sort of widespread view would be that in the short, this is, this here is a good story for the long run, but not necessarily for the short run. And then this, this part of the story where you've got an interest rate mediating between savings and investment, um, the loanable fund story is one that's also widely held, although it, it coexists in sort of a weird tension with the Keynesian story we're going to turn to next, and, and people kind of try to believe both, even though they're, they're very different stories. So, um, uh, but, but in any case, you know, this, that, and the idea, you know, that, that people saving more is going to stimulate more investment, you know, as we look on the flowchart, saving, higher savings, lower interest rate, lower interest rate, higher investment. You know, whenever we do these things, a negative sign, a negative relationship means that if this goes down, this goes up. So more savings, lower interest rate, lower interest rate, higher investment. Is, is absolutely a story that people get 
people tell, although I'm not sure they always tell it in, a, in any logically consistent way. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop here and then pick up um, in a in a second video on the on the Keynesian model.